when you read Ernest Hemingway, you get the impression that he's the master of dialogue, that he understands the short, terse statements people make. He knows exchange. He knows how people react toward each other in a normal sequence. I told uh, one writer once that if she really wanted to describe how people spoke, edge your chair in the school cafeteria, in the university cafeteria, near two or three people who are talking. And just record their conversation as they're speaking while they're eating and you're able to get realistic conversation. Or if you're on a school bus that's fairly crowded, sit there recording what people say, and you get a sense of the dialogue and the movement. But if, but if it were only terse dialogue, if it were only the economy of words, if it were only the, the capability to hone description, we might not fully understand Hemingway's style. Hoffman, whom I, uh, Stephen Hoffman, whom I mentioned earlier, John Hollander, whom I mentioned earlier, Philip Young, they recognize another quality in Hemingway's works, and that is his lyric quality. They claim he's not a prose writer, he's a poet, and he organizes words and formulates them as poetry. Hollander says that throughout in our time there are vignettes, and as you read the text, you discover that Hemingway has inserted before each story a small excerpt, an excerpt that either carries over a tone from the previous story or moves into the next story. But these interludes, I call them, although they are inextricably located, a, 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 identified with the stories, seem to be apart from the stories. But they are prose poems, and I want to look at some of them in the next few moments as we discover these elements and interstices that unite in our time and bring the stories together. Now, it's possible to read these interludes, to read these short passages, as a separate text, as a text demonstrating the formidable task of living that people understand. Stephen Hoffman refers to this as the nada, as the void, as the existential absence of presence of the inability of predictability, of the suffering men must f go through because they cannot anticipate what they're going to experience, nor fully understand the scope of the actions they perform. Well, let's see what happens. For example, chapter one is a scene from the military experience. You can't see it very well on the screen, but since it is a prose poem, I want to look at it once, and you do have it in your text. And it's apparently a war scene. And it reads this way. Everybody was drunk. The whole battery was drunk going along the road in the dark. We were going to the Champagne. The lieutenant kept riding his horse out into the fields and saying to him, I'm drunk. I tell you, mon vieux, oh, I'm so salted. We went along the road all night in the dark, and the adjutant kept riding up alongside my kitchen and saying, you must put it out. It is dangerous. It will be observed. We were 50 kilometers from the front, but the adjutant worried about the fire in my kitchen. It was funny going along that road. That was when I was a kitchen corporal. Now, 
What is poetic about that phrase? There are certain rhythms. We're moving, we're moving, we're moving. We're drunk, we're drunk, we're soused. We're military, we're military, we got to put out the fire. And all along it's the corporal. Encapsulating all these ideas, moving along with his field kitchen, the flame glowing, giving light to a scene that otherwise is dark while everybody was drunk. What are the rhythms? Everybody was drunk. Everybody. The whole battery was drunk. Going along the road in the dark. Going along the road in the dark. That's an epistic rhythm. That's da da dum, da da dum, da da dum. Going along in the dark. You've got a poem that you're looking at. Let's move on to another episode. This begins, now I'm not going to explain how these introduce a story, uh, how they react. But again, what we have are scenes, military scenes, and most of these interludes are military scenes, as though Nick Adams is recalling his whole military experience as he recalls his youth and as he explains what's been happening during his lifetime. But the military is a profound impact because he was wounded. Minarets stuck up in the rain out of Andrianopol across the mud flats. Each word has its impact. The carts were jammed for 30 miles along the Karagetch Road. The carts were jammed for 30 miles along the Karagetch Road. Da dum da dum da 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 dum da dum da dum da dum. You're getting your anapestic rhythm. You're getting the march. You're getting the movement. Water buffalo and cattle were hauling carts through the mud. Water buffalo and cattle. Buffalo and cattle. You're getting your anapests and you're getting your trochees, you're getting your soft beats to accent against the hard beats. This is poetry. No end and no beginning. And that's metaphorical. We heard before the power of illusion when we referred to Chesterton, when we referred to Walpole. But here we have, with no end and no beginning, that contradicts Genesis. And military life, the war, contradicts the hope for life because it's destructive. Just carts loaded with everything they owned. Now we're going to see the refugees pulling out of the villages that are being shelled and being mined. The old men and women soaked through, walked along keeping the cattle moving, keeping the cattle moving. Are we reading poetry? Are we reading lyrical language? Are we reading a poem that looks as a prose statement? Now Maritza was running yellow almost up to the bridge. Carts were jammed solid on the bridge with camels bobbing along through them. Greek cavalry herded along the procession. Greek cavalry herded along the procession. When you juxtapose words and you wrench them out of character, we know that Greek cavalry would move. But the Greek cavalry are now herding the camels. Greek cavalry herded them along the procession. Women and kids were in the carts, crouched with mattresses, mirrors, sewing machines, bundles. Mirrors, sewing machines, and bundles. Again, a troche, mirrors, sewing machines, bundles. You're following a rhythm. You're following po a poetic beat and a measure. 
There was a woman having a kid with a young girl holding a blanket over her and crying, scared, sick, looking at it, the soldiers. It rained all through the evacuation. It rained all through the evacuation. Now you've got here. You've got a poem describing the masses moving along in this military formation, probably in retreat. Cavalry, camels, women, men, pregnant women delivering their children, fleeing the enemy. And there we have it encapsulated. One page, one look, one glimpse, one poem. Here are some American soldiers sitting in a courtyard, knowing that perhaps there are German troops moving toward them. This is probably the RAF name of the name of one of the, one of the soldiers is Buckley, so it's probably not an American troop, but uh, English. Let's look at this scene. We were in this again, a prose poem. It's a vignette. It's a picture, and yet it's so stylized. The language is so honed. The articulation is so perfect that we're looking at a poet and not a fiction writer in the, se in the sense of narrative. We were in a garden at Mons. Young Buckley came in with his patrol from across the river. The first German I saw climbed up over the garden wall. We waited till he got one leg over and then potted him. He had so much equipment on and looked awfully surprised and fell down into the garden. Then three more came over further down the wall. We shot them. They all came just like that. Ring around the rosy. They all came just like that. They all came just like that. Now, there are certain impressions from this poem. Number one, there's a sequence. We're there. What's going to happen? His first German he sees. This is illumination. This is discovery. This is meeting the enemy. This is the challenge that all heroes, events, and literature this is a challenge that all romantics, remember when the Sutpin went to war? They first saw all the women and told them they were going to war, and they celebrated in parties because of the romantic venture. But there's no romance in Hemingway's war. He's a correspondent, and he sees what happens. And that German climbing over the wall, thinking he's going to scan, scale over, and then drop to the bottom, draw his weapon, fall in a crouch, and aim it at the enemy is dead before he has a chance to fulfill any of his hopes, promises, ambitions, or ambitions and training. And then what are the Soldiers are waiting for the others coming over the wall. We potted them. Three dead. There's no romance here. Now, this was written in the 19, 1925, 1923. This was one of the shocking things about the Vietnamese War, believe it or not. The Vietnamese War was the first war broadcast on television. And we would sit at the table watching a battle scene. And a man would get shot, and he would collapse. No histrionics. No, oh, I'm shot. Help me, help me. No plea to his friends. No friends running over to help him. Man standing, he's shot, and he falls. Silence. And we kept on eating. And the Vietnamese War became a war that no one understood because it suddenly 
became de-romanticized. Death is nothing more than a person's heart being stopped or his head being blown off and no more action coming from his systemic being. And here is Hemingway giving us that war and telling us that there's nothing romantic here. Just a group of people boorishly shooting or protecting themselves from being shot. And the rhythm of that passage, we were in the garden at Mons. Young Buckley came in with his patrol from across the river. There are rhythms there. Pick them up. The first German I saw climbed up over the garden wall, climbed up over the first I saw. Da dum, da dum, da dum. You, 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 you're following an anapestic rhythm. You're following a rhythm with beats and unstressed syllables. German, beat and unstressed German. Garden. He understands how to draw our attention with poetry that grips us and that becomes a vignette of monumental proportions by identifying the concept that Hoffman talks about and that Hemingway himself describes as nada, nothingness. Hemingway giving us what Sartre well understood in being and nothingness, the existential void. Chapter 4, let's look at this poem. It was a frightful hot day. Now remember, we have not yet tried to understand the manner in which these stories introduce, uh, these poems, these vignettes, introduce us to the power of the stories that follow. And we'll be getting some sense of the power of these stories in a few moments when Miss Everett describes Big Two-Hearted River and Miss Carney goes into the killers. It was a frightfully hot day. We jammed an absolutely perfect barricade across the bridge. It was simply priceless. Can you imagine how proud the soldiers are building that barricade? You're proud of what you do because you do it with others. A big old wrought iron grating from the front of a house. That's what we took. Too heavy to lift and you could shoot through it and they would have to climb over. It was absolutely topping. They tried to go over it, and we potted them from 40 yards. They rushed it, and officers came out alone and worked on it. It was an absolutely perfect obstacle. Their officers were very fine. We were frightfully put out when we heard the flank had gone, and we had to fall back. But you stopped them. You stopped them momentarily. You did your job. And you get that vignette, that image, that prose poem suggesting that in the midst of this malaise, in the midst of this despair, in the midst of this retreat, in the midst of the lives that are lost and the bodies buried in the mud, vehicles pushing over them, you have this point of pride. We set up a barrier and it held. Chapter 5, Another Interlude. This is brutal. This is brutal. And this is one of those elements of the revolutionary events 
it shows the brutality of the victor. And indeed, we have examples of this in Bosnia. Even the trials going on today suggest that situations like these occurred. They shot the six cabinet ministers at half past six in the morning against the wall of a hospital. Read it again. They shot the six cabinet ministers at half past six in the morning against the wall of a hospital. There's your image, poets. There are six against the wall. And then you have the dawn. This is not the dawn of Aurora. This is not the dawn of love breaking out in the morning looking for lovers in mythology. This is not the dawn that's going to see night coming where love can be sated and satiated. This is a dawn that will see no night. They shot the six cabinet ministers at half past six in the morning against the wall of a hospital. There were pools of water in the courtyard. There were wet dead leaves on the paving of the courtyard. Look at the repetition. There were pools of water in the courtyard. There were wet dead leaves on the paving of the courtyard. It rained hard. All the shutters of the hospital were nailed shut. One of the ministers was sick with typhoid. Two soldiers carried him downstairs and out into the rain. They tried to hold him up against the wall, but he sat down in a puddle of water. The other five stood very quietly against the wall. Finally, the officer told the soldiers it was no good trying to make him stand up when they fired the first volley. He was sitting down in the water with his head on his knees. Death of the ball turret gunner, the scenes of death in leaves of grass. These are the images that Hemingway gives us in this poetic fashion. What are the rhythms? Half past six, dead leaves on the paving, hospital nailed shut sick with typhoid, into the rain, against the wall, puddle of water, against the wall, fired the volley, sitting in the water, head on his knees. These are the trope, the trope of despair, devastation, destruction, denial, death. They give us the sense of nada in the interludes of In Our Time. These are prose poems. And when we talk about the pristine nature of Hemingway's language, we may in fact fully accept the idea that we are talking about a poet as well as a writer of fiction. And they are not necessarily separate things in uh, Hemingway's works. Of course, number six is the telling device. And this is one of the pivotal points in, in our time. We realize that Nick Adams himself is wounded in battle. He has to go to the hospital. Scenes like this become important in Farewell to Arms. But let's look at how Nick is wounded. Because it's not only the physical wound, but the psychological wound that he must carry with him. And this is one of the reasons why I think that when Nick leaves the army, when he comes home and can't bear to hear, ha hear his mother nagging him about what he should be doing with his life, that he goes on the road. And so while well, Philip Young looks at it one way. I think it may be possible to see Nick Adams facing the battler and facing 
the, uh, the killers after this wartime experience. Let's look and see what we find here. And again, on the screen you're going to see the poem, but because I want you to encapsulate and see the, the, the whole scene, it's not going to look as, e you're not going to be read it as easily as you would read it in the book. But this is the pivotal point. This is the climactic point. And the climactic point is not the point when things are going to get Right. The climax of any work, play, novel, is the scene at which events are going to take a final turn for the better or for the worse. Now, because Nick is wounded, it's going to turn for the worse. His despair. And when we move to Big Two-Hearted River, we're going to see him trying to come over, overcome this depression. Nick sat against the wall of the church where they had dragged him to be clear of machine gun fire in the street. Both legs stuck out awkwardly. He had been hit in the spine. He had been hit in the spine. That's a poem. It's brutal, but the rhythm is understood. His face was sweaty and dirty. The sun shone on his face. The day was very hot. Nick sat against the wall of the church where they had dragged him to be clear of machine gun fire in the street. Both legs stuck out awkwardly. He had been hit in the spine. His face was sweaty and dirty. The sun shone on his face. The day was very hot. Rinaldi, big back, his equipment sprawling, lay face downward against the wall. Nick looked straight ahead brilliantly. The pink wall of the house opposite had fallen out from the roof and an iron bedstead hung twisted toward the street. Two Austrian led dead lay Two Austrian dead lay in the rubble in the shade of the house. Up the street were other dead. Things were getting forward in the town. It was going well. They were winning the battle, but here was Nick, wounded in the spine, one of his buddies dead in the earth, and the battle's going well. And finally, Nick turned his head and looked at Rinaldi. Senta Rinaldi, Senta, you and me, we've made a separate peace. Whatever peace the United, whatever peace the nations celebrate, is their peace. One's dead, we're, one's wounded. We've made a separate peace. Our war is over. Those are the lines in poetry one remembers. Rinaldi lay still in the sun, breathing with difficulty. Not patriots. Nick turned his head carefully away, smiling, sweatily. Rinaldi was a disappointing audience. He's dying. He's dead. He's a disappointing audience. He doesn't understand the triumph Nick now has, knowing that he's over with the war. But there he is with the injury. Here is the vignette, the whole essence of war encapsulated in two people for whom the war is over, who know that they've done what they must and may survive or may not. But if a poem is a synecdoche for life, if the events of this poem can expand upon what we think life is, then it's a very large price paid for a very small time in one's lifetime. Hemingway, who was the premier war correspondent, does not romanticize war. And these vignettes became brilliant poems describing the psychology 
and the nature of war and giving us poetic moments that stay with us because the text, the wording, is so precisely chosen that one will never forget a separate piece. But we're going to move on now. We covered from the war, but not from the war experience. Home again, but not psychologically home, because all these wartime events, he keeps recalling interlude after interlude after interlude, story after story after story. And he goes into a state of depression. And we're going to study that state of depression when Miss Everett discusses Big Two-Hearted River. I'm going to discuss Hemingway's story, Big Two-Hearted River, tonight. I have only a few dates to share that are relevant to the story in particular. In 1918, Hemingway spent a brief period of uh, time in Italy working as an ambulance driver in uh, World War I. During that time, he received a wound to his groin. There is some belief that this rendered him impotent at the time. There is some suggestion that Nick, with his spinal injury, uh, may be suffering a similar trauma uh, when he re uh, arrives in the town of Senni. According to Kenneth Lynn, a critic, during the summer, a, um, a year after his return from the war, Hemingway went on a fishing trip with two friends. The three of them caught close to 200 fish within seven days. Uh, Hemingway was also um, reported during this uh, uh, by this critic as having said he had almost caught the biggest fish he ever saw and it got away. So the big fish stories repeated in uh, Big Two-Hearted River. In 1924, Hemingway wrote Big uh, Two-Hearted River and it was included in his book In Our Time, which was published in 1925. Uh, Big Two-Hearted River is a short story uh, this means it's very condensed. If there's an image, the reader can be assured there's a purpose for it. There are several twos in the story. Two-Hearted River, two books, two days. I believe this stands for the duality of life, which is woven into the storyline. One of the major symbols in the story is the river. A river in literature often is often symbolic of life. In this story, the river has two hearts. One way of living is to be an observer, watching others live. Uh, the other way is to embrace life, even conquer it. I believe Hemingway clearly contrasts these two options in his story. Uh, day one is filled with vivid imagery. Uh, Nick is portrayed as an outsider, a passive observer, looking at his surroundings. Day two joins Nick with his surroundings, and he is healed and renewed. Uh, Hemingway, as you've already seen in the presentations, was a master at classical rhetoric. Um, predominantly, I found Hemingway used uh, Scotuson. According to Lanham, Lan Lanham's uh, rhetoric terms, the Greek rhetoric teachers taught their pupils to make their writing obscure. Uh, the teachers would tell them Scotuson, that is, darken it. Uh, when a rewrite was graded, the teacher would praise them with so much better even I couldn't even uh, understand it. <laughs> so it was, and he does this in his story here. Hemingway epitomizes in Argia. He creates visually powerful, vivid descriptions which recreate images and people before your very eyes. His attention to detail puts the reader in the shoes of Nick. Hemingway uses topographia landscape imagery in the story, but hydrographia, water imagery, pre predominates. I wanted to share my um, mem memorable quote right now because it seemed like a really good example of the Energia. Uh, 
Another hopper poked his face out of the bottle. His antenna wavered. He was getting his front legs out of the bottle to jump. Nick took him by the head and held him while he threaded the slim hook under his chin, down through his thorax, and into the last segments of his abdomen. The grasshopper took hold of the hook with his front feet, spitting tobacco juice on it. The critic Kenneth Lynn found some letters that Hemingway wrote uh, that indicate that Nick in Big Two-Hearted River is suffering from the trauma of World War I, like so many other American men at this time. Although it's never mentioned in the text, 24 years later, in August of 1948, Hemingway wrote a letter to Malcolm Coley, a critic, telling him that Big, Heart, Big Two-Hearted River was about a man who was home from the war. Again, a few years later, he wrote to the New York Times that Big Two-Hearted River was a story about a boy who had come back from the war. The readers in the 20s, to them, Nick was not an enigma. For these people, assumed that Nick's key, uh, Nick's secret, the key to Nick's secret was the fact that his creator was the archetypical representative of a war-scarred last generation. World War I veterans never recovered from what they had seen. This war was referred to as the wholesale wasting of human beings. Um, there is some allusion to T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland in the story. Hemingway gives the reader a hint on page 134 when he writes that Nick looked into the stream and saw the kingfisher. The combination of the burned out town and the kingfisher lead the reader to believe that there is a connection to T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. I found an essay by Susan Schmidt which supports this idea, Big Two-Hearted River begins in the burned out town of Sydney, Michigan, a wasteland. In Eliot's The Wasteland, the Fisher King is the final image of renewal. His health is tied to the fertility of the land. His recovery brings back productivity. The imagery changes significantly, significantly from book one to book two as Nick, as a Fisher King, goes from illness to health. Big Two-Hearted River, part one, begins on page 133 of my copy of um, Hemingway's short story book, In Our Time. When Nick is dropped off by the train, he is at the mercy of his environment. He doesn't even take his baggage with him. The action is taken when the baggage man had pitched his bundle and bedding out of the train. Nick sits, an inactive participant of his surroundings. Nick, traumatized by too much death and destruction, is overwhelmed by the wasting of the town of Sini. He has to sit down. In the paragraphs that open the story, Nick is described as extremely passive. The, wor the verb was, which renders a character helpless, is used again and again. He is an observer, a watcher, an outsider of the environment. He is looking at the town, the hillside, the river, and the fish. When he does move, it is slow. When he and then he walks and he climbs. Nick is watching the river, watching life. Juxtaposed against Nick's inactivity, the environment is active. The fire had actively chipped, split, and burned the town. The road runs, the pine trees rise. As Nick crosses the burn line and enters the sweet burn, the country is described as alive. Nick moves from watching to becoming aware. He thinks, he realizes, and he wonders. There is a turning point in book one when Nick turns and moves toward the pine trees. Hemingway now begins to describe nature as more passive, assigning the was verb to many of its description. Nick takes a nap in this passive, safe environment. When he awakes, he is glad for the first time in the story, glad to get to the river glad to be so close to life. He begins to mount the hill to make camp. When Nick arrives on the hill, he begins to take aggressive action for the first time, yet it is a struggle. He ties, pulls, hangs, pokes, hits, and buries. This is followed by a very passive paragraph. The contrast of action and passive pa uh, passages is a tool which Hemingway is using to show the struggle of recovery within Nick. 
Nick goes through a period of forgetting and remembering. Again, we see his struggle. He recalls his friend Hopkins, an old fishing buddy who abandoned his friendship when he made millions. There is a loss here that Hemingway continues um, in a passage a couple of paragraphs later. As Nick prepares the evening meal, there appear to be infant images surrounding him. He is still weak and vulnerable. During the meal, Nick empties, watches, drinks, and sex. Without the reader's knowledge, Hemingway is giving images of a dependent breastfeeding infant. Then images of loss return. The coffee grinds run down the side of the pot. The apricot tin is empty. Although Nick remains weak like a child, he has lost his li li um, childlike innocence. Then Nick laughs for the first time in the text, a release from tension. Quickly he follows this with the choking of his thoughts. They are still too painful and he is exhausted. The day ends with Nick in a fetal position. He curled up under the blanket and went to sleep. Nick is portrayed as weak, helpless, and impotent. Nick is reborn in book two of Big Two-Hearted River. The environment in this book becomes passive and Nick becomes the conqueror. The text reads that in the morning the sun was up, the tent was starting to get hot. Yet Nick crawls like a transition from childhood out of the tent and builds a fire. Then he rapidly mixes some buckwheat. This is the first real display of energy that Nick has shown. The tone of the story is changing. The reader can feel the lightning of Nick's mental anxiety. Nick then begins to be associated with secure images. The way he eats his breakfast is described as covered, folded, and wrapped. Major change occurs after breakfast as Nick prepares to go fishing. There's a transition to Nick's union uh, with his environment, his return to life. In the paragraph that begins with Nick took his fishing rod out, Hemingway weights the paragraph with union imagery. Words like jointed, threaded, coiled, tied, and fastened. These words are no accident. Nick is headed toward the river, toward life. The prospect of the upcoming fishing experience, Nick's union with life, leaves Nick feeling awkward, yet happy. The imagery is thoroughly suggestive and of anticipated sexual union. In his shirt, the breast pockets bulged. These descripti descriptive words are purposeful. The remainder of book, book two is rife with fertility images. Nick is submerged in the river, submerged in life. The language which Hemingway uses to describe this is particular to sexual imagery. The first fis fishing scene includes the following passages. Nick's trousers clung tight. There was a rigid shock. The current sucked against his legs. The gravel slid, and he floated rapidly, kicking. Nick has become the fertile fisher king. After Nick catches his first trout as the empowered fisher king, he releases him. The language of the text then becomes passive and relaxed. As Nick enters the river for the second time, the fer fertility images are revived. The text reads that the strain was too great, the hardness too tight, and when the fish get away, Nick's hand was shaky. The thrill had been too much. He felt a little sick and had to sit down. Nick sits down and has a cigarette. Then he laughs, and soon the feeling of disappointment leaves him. The next time Nick fishes, he is very sure of himself. Again, Hemingway uses sexual imagery. He uses words like plunging, bending alive, pumping, holding, rushing, yielding, and jerking. Nick is now the conquering Fisher King. In the course of the story, Nick has gone from emasculation to mastery and dominance. As the Fisher King, he knows that he can dominate even the swamp. He is ready for anything life can send his way. He is renewed, refreshed, and healed. Thank you.
the celebrated image of a fish in the water. Exemplary of man himself in the stream of life. Sometimes to get away, sometimes to be caught. But moving inexorably from one place to the other is the central theme of Hemingway's stories and certainly these two. One of the major stories in the Nick Adams experiences is a story titled The Killers. It did not appear in In Our Time, but it is identified by Philip Young among the Nick Adams stories. And it deals so brutally with the experience of life or death that it becomes one of the great stories ever written. And uh, Ms. Carney is going to discuss the killers. Hemingway, and uh, it appeared in the book uh, Men Without Women. And um, first off, I wanted to uh, talk about techniques that uh, Ernest Hemingway used. The first thing he did was um, he used one long scene that takes place in the diner and three short scenes. Um, the focus of the narrator is uh, objective, meaning that this was an uh, uninvolved non-character, someone that's just observing, not actually in the story. Um, there's simple realistic dialogue and the writing style and the characters were simple by design. Um, Hemingway used this dramatic device that um, it just, you know, he used it to create his desired effect. Um, the setting is location um, is a small American town called Summit and I think Dr. Rothman said that was in Illinois or that was supposed to be taking place there. I don't know if he had said that or not but um, the time is the 1920s and the scenes take place in what used to be an old saloon, but it's now been, I guess, like remodeled into a diner or I think they call it a lunch room. And uh, it also takes place in a rooming house. Okay, now I'm going to do a uh, plot summary. Um, starts out with, let's see, hold on. Um, Nick Adams is a customer at a small town diner and working there are George, the owner, and the, the guy that works at the bar, and Sam, the cook. And um, Nick is a young man, probably in his late teens, who at the moment lives in this town. Uh, he was sitting at the counter talking to George. George, we assume, is older than Nick, and he's the owner of the diner, and the diner's called Henry's, um, which may be the name carried over from the days when it had been a saloon. Um, Sam, the African-American cook, is in the kitchen throughout most of the story. Um, the two men, Al and Max, who are also the killers, enter looking for a man named Ole Anderson, and um, their dress and speech mimic old gangster movies. Let's see. Um, they're strangers in the town. They come in at the beginning of the story. They're dressed like twins with derby hats and tight black overcoats, wearing silk mufflers and gloves. Um, after much discussion, they order something to eat, but you can tell that food was not their purpose for coming because when the food was served, they can't remember um, who ordered what. Oddly, both men um, ate with their gloves on, which you figure later was to leave no fingerprints, I guess, on the utensils. And after eating, Max, one of the killers, orders Nick behind the counter with George and tells George to order Sam, the cook, out of the kitchen. Um, you notice that Al is carrying a sawed-off shotgun and that um, 
he takes Nick and Sam back into the kitchen and tie, uh, ties them up and gags them with, uh, with a towel. Um, they set a trap for Ole Anderson, who never arrives. And um, while they're while they're doing the, while Al does this, and back in the in the kitchen, Max stays at the counter watching for anyone to enter in the mirror behind George. Um, it is here that they reveal their true purpose when they ask about Ole Anderson. They boast, they boast that they are there to kill Anderson to oblige a friend. Okay. Um, Al and Max, after figuring out that um, you know they waited over an, an hour, Anderson never shows up. So they decide that they're going to leave the diner. And um, George, after they've left, George suggests to Nick that um, he find Anderson. In, um, in spite of Sam the cook's warning that it would be better to stay out of it. So um, Nick goes to Anderson's, uh, well, goes to the rooming house that Anderson's, Anderson is staying in to warn him. And um, when, he get, when he arrives, Anderson is in his room laying on the bed fully dressed. Um, mind you, he'd been a former heavyweight prize fighter, so he's, he's just this big guy and he's like hanging off the bed. and. Um, Anderson never looks at Nick when Nick explains what has happened at the diner. Anderson acts as if, as if um, he expected the news. This was not a shock to him. Um, Anderson says, you know, he's tired of running. He seems resigned to his fate. And then um, Nick leaves and returns to the diner, and um, he tells George Anderson has no intention of getting help or escaping. Um, Oh, well, let me back up. When, he, when he's leaving the, the rooming house, he runs into the landlady, Mrs. Bell, and um, she doesn't know, you know, what's happened at the diner, but she, you know, has, she says to, to Nick that she's encouraged Anderson to go out for a walk, and when he refused, she assumed that he didn't feel well. She describes Anderson as a nice, gentle man. Okay, um, so then Nick gets back to the diner, and he tells George that old Anderson you know, doesn't plan to do anything, he's just going to, you know, just wait it out. And um, it is revealed that Anderson had pre previously lived in Chicago, that's what George says, and George thinks that he probably double-crossed somebody, which resulted in the contract on his life. Um, and basically, Nick is forever changed by this experience. He, um, he's frightened by the brutality of what he's just experienced, you know, being bound and gagged at gunpoint, as well as the prospects of Anderson being killed. He declares, I'm going to get out of this town. So, um, and then I was going to talk about the characters a little. Um, Nick Adams, a young man probably in his teens, the central character. The story has the greatest impact upon him. His adolescence is the key uh, to the outcome of the story because of the innocence of his youth. The experience is very traumatic, and um, he decides to leave town. Um, George, the owner of Henry's Diner, and older than Nick. Uh, his personality is very matter of fact. His role is that of a guide for Nick's character. He accepts the situation and um, it's really not life changing for him. Um, let me read, oh, wrong book. Let me read a quote. And it's in page 95 and 96 of the book I have. I don't know what page y'all have. But um, it starts um, Did you tell him about it? George asked. Sure, I told him, but he knows what it's all about. What's he going to do? Nothing. They'll kill him. I guess they will. He must have got mixed up in something in Chicago. I guess so, said Nick. It's a hell of a thing. It's an awful thing, Nick said. They did not say, they did not say anything. George reached down for a towel and wiped the counter. I wonder what he did, Nick said. Double cross somebody. That's what they kill him for. I'm going to get out of this town, Nick said. Yes, said George. That's a good thing to do. I can't stand to think about him waiting in the room and knowing he's going to get it. It's too damned awful. Well, said George, you better not think about it. So that kind of just leaves you, you know, thinking that George's kind of like, well, you know, he's just accepted the fact and, you know, you can't do anything about it. You can't stop it. So, okay, um, next character, Sam, um, the cook in the diner. Uh, in contrast to Nick's character, he does not, he doesn't want to get involved at all. His attitude is, you know, kind of the less I know, the better probably because he realizes the danger in getting involved and, um, you know, knowing too much, I guess. And then there's a quote I wanted to read from, um, from Sam on page, my page 90. 
uh, the cook felt the corners of his mouth with his thumbs. They all gone, he asked. Yes, said George, they're gone now. I don't like it, said the cook. I don't like any of it all. Listen, George, said to Nick, you better go see old Anderson. All right. You better not have anything to do with it at all, Sam the cook said. You better stay way out of it. So he obviously thought that it was not a good idea for, for Nick to go warn um, Anderson about it. Alan Max, um, the two gangster hitmen that are looking for Ole Anderson, their appearance and language pattern is the stereotype of mob characters as seen in the movies. They are sarcastic and live by a code of behavior unknown in this small town. And um, I wanted to read a quote on page 84 with them speaking. Well, bright boy, Max said, looking into the mirror, why don't you say something? What's it all about? Hey, Al, Max called. Bright boy wants to know what it's all about. Why, why don't you tell him? Al's voice came from the kitchen. What do you think it's all about? I don't know. Well, what do you think? Max looked into the mirror all the time he was talking. I wouldn't say. Hey, Al, bright boy says he wouldn't say what he thinks it's all about. And so it just kind of shows, you know, their sarcasm and the way they interact with each other. And so... Um, next in the line of characters is Ole Anderson, um, former prize fighter from Chicago, probably retired, a large man of Swedish descent. He seems stoic and resigned to his fate. His attitude is live by the code and die by the code. The unanswered question is why was there a contract on his life? Did he fail to keep a bargain with organized crime or did he refuse to be dishonest in the ring? And um, I wanted to read a quote from him that just kind of shows how he's, you know, kind of taking the attitude of, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't care that, you know, they're going to come after him. He's accepted it. Um, it starts on 92. Don't you want me to go and see the police? No, Ole Anderson said. That wouldn't do any good. Isn't there something I could do? No, there ain't, no, there ain't anything to do. Maybe it was just a bluff. No, it ain't a bluff. Ole Anderson rolled over toward the wall. The only thing is, he said, talking towards the wall, I just can't make up my mind to go out. I've been in here all day. Couldn't you get out of town? No, Ole Anderson said. I'm through with all that running around. He looked at the wall. There ain't anything to do now. Couldn't you fix it up some way? No, I got in wrong. He talked in the same flat voice. There ain't anything to do. So he kind of leads you to believe that, you know, he's, you know, maybe been on the run and that he's just tired now um, of running. Okay, uh, Mrs. Bell is the landlady at Hirsch's rooming house where Ole Anderson lives. She knows Anderson as a kind, gentle man. And uh, if her assessment of, the, of his character is accurate, one might speculate that he refused to cooperate with, some, with organized crime. You know, maybe they wanted him to fix a fight and he refused or um, something along those lines. Um, okay, I, I have thought about a couple of themes for the story um, and I saw some criticisms on. Um, one was the transition from adolescence into adulthood. Um, Nick Adams is the main character in a series of short stories by Ernest Hemingway. The Killers is considered a transition story in the developmental the de development of Nick's character from adolescence to manhood. Nick is disturbed by the events of the story and decides to leave town. Clues to the upheaval in Nick's world are um, that a, a man named George owns Henry's Diner. Um, that uh, the diner was once a bar, but now uh, or a bar saloon, you know, but now it's this lunch room. Um, that the diner clock runs 20 minutes fast, and um, that Mrs. Bell, the landlady, is mistaken for Mrs. Hirsch, the owner at the at the rooming house. Um, the above clues are all inconsistencies that occur in the story, pointing to an impending change in Nick's life. And then another theme um, was the discovery of evil, kind of a reality check for Nick since he seemed to have never, you know, I guess realized that, you know, bad things like this happen. Um, the trauma of being bound and gagged uh, changes Nick's view of life. Previously in Nick's mind, this only happened in um, thrillers and movies. The gangster's dress, speech, and code of con conduct, once a part of Nick's fantasy, become reality. And the realization that Ole Anderson will be killed and that he's unwilling to protect himself is unacceptable, is an unacceptable horror to Nick. And um, Nick's re uh, reaction is to flee the new reality, and by, by fleeing the new reality, he's just going to leave town. And um, 
I think in the end, Nick loses his youthful innocence with the, this experience of this evilness. And so ironically, it's probably Nick's innocence that is responsible for his outrage and willingness to get involved in the first place. So, that's kind of Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Carney. The discovery that what <clears throat> just make sure I've got this on. The discovery that one's life can be controlled by others and that one has no control over one's life becomes the ultimate fright of the Nick Adams stories. The fact that people can come in and insinuate themselves upon you, can direct your life and take your life and take your life for no better reason than you are, you deceive them or to take your life for no other reason than they've been paid to take your life becomes the reality of the Nick Adams experience. It becomes a recognition of the fact that we are not in control of our lives and that chance to some extent and experience may lead us and may leave us uh, empty bodies and empty souls. One of the stories that gives us that impression and it's a brutal story in its own right is a story called The Battler. You find it in your text uh, in, a, in our time uh, at chapter 53. Now, it's an interesting aspect of the unification of this work that the battle occurs imme immediately after that chapter in the interludes in which the six ministers have been shot. Five ministers standing against the wall, one so sick that he's kneeling in a puddle and is shot while he can stand. Knowing that these ministers who once had power and have lost power are now dead moves us into another story where people who are dead or where people are dead while still living. In this particular story, Nick has been hopping trains. He's somewhat inexperienced. And one of the brakemen calls him over. Nick Adams thinks he's going to be treated gently. Instead, the brakeman smashes him in the face. And Nick feels a big bump coming of his eye, on his eye and throws him off the train. Nick then starts moving away from the train tracks. <coughs> away from the caboose, away from the water of the swamps on either side of the tracks, and he finds a man standing by a fire, an ex-boxer, Ed Francis, a little guy who seems friendly and invites Nick Adams to join him. And Nick Adams recognizes him as a boxer. But something doesn't look right about him. One ear is gone. The other ear is smashed against his face. The man has taken every punch. And he is literally punch drunk. But he opens his arms to Nick Adams. Nick Adams isn't sure what he's getting himself into. Ed Francis, challenges, Ed Francis challenges him. You know, he says, why I was such a good fighter and how I could survive the punches of people much larger than I. And then he takes Nick Adams' hand and puts it against his heart. He says, look at that heartbeat. 
count to 60. It's a slow heartbeat. It controls me. It allows me to pace myself. It allows me to survive. Feeling the slow, hard throb under his fingers, Nick started to count. He heard the little man counting slowly, one, two, three, four, five, and on aloud. That's right, Ad says happily. She never speeds up. She never speeds up. The rhythm, of course, of the story is the rhythm of Ad France's heart. It never speeds up. And as Nick Adams comes off the train, the tra he is he's wearing this shiner. He moves slowly. He moves methodically. He moves bitterly away from the brakeman. He moves toward Ad Francis. And we have this very, very unique pacing. The pacing is the pacing established by Ad Francis' heart, 40 beats, 60 beats. Things are moving slowly. And then, at that moment, over the hill comes a large black man, Bugs, who is Ad Francis' partner and Ad Francis' mate. Ad Francis says, He's cra I'm crazy, and so is this man crazy, Bugs. Bugs has brought food, this large Negro. And they begin to fry it into a skillet. He was laying slices of ham. As the skillet grew hot, the grease sputtered. As the skillet grew hot, the grease sputtered. You're getting back into rhythms. You're getting back into prose poetry. And Bugs, crouching on long nigger legs over the fire, turned the ham and broke eggs into the skillet tipping it from side to side to baste the eggs with hot fat. And we have the repetition of eggs. And we have this, again, slow pulsation, slow movement. The heart is moving along. The eggs turned. The eggs broke in a skillet. The eggs are based in the hot fat. We're reading a poem. Nick Adams cuts his bread with a knife that he takes from his bag. And Ed says, let me take your knife. Nick might have given him. No, you don't, the Negro said. Hang on to your knife, Mr. Adams. And then at that point, we realize that the equilibrium has been lost. There's a little faster movement. And we realize that something is happening here that's likely to change the psychology of these people, or at least Ad Francis toward Nick Adams. He was innocent before the brakeman. He was innocent before Ad Francis. And now is his innocence going to get him a worse injury than the brakeman served him? That's where the moment picks up. Negro paces it again. Just close that sandwich, will you please, Mr. Adams, and give it to Mr. Francis. Ad took the sandwich and started eating. Nick bit into the sandwich. The Negro was sitting opposite him beside Ad. The hot fried ham and eggs tasted wonderful to Nick. He finally is with friends. But suddenly, Ad Francis stands up, looks at Nick, and says, how the hell do you get that way? Who the hell do you think you are? Begins to pick up the pace. You're a snotty bastard. You come in here where nobody asks you and eat a man's food. And when he asks to borrow a knife, you get snotty. Ed Francis is starting to get aggressive. He glared at Nick. Who are, you're a hot sketch. Who the hell asked you to butt in here? Nobody, says Nick. 
You're damn right nobody did. Nobody asked you to stay either. You come in here and act snotty about my face and smoke my cigars and drink my liquor and then talk snotty. None of which he's done. Ad Francis now is going off into his world, his world that's been beaten into his brain fight after fight and made him, he's right, he's crazy. Hit me, he says to Nick Adams. Try and hit me. I don't want to hit you. You won't get out of it that way. The rhythms of the language begin moving. Come on and lead at me. Cut it out, Nick said. All right, then. And just as he lunges forward, the black man taps Ad Francis on the head with a blackjack. Francis falls to the grass. He's protected him. And then we learn other stories. The black man tells Nick Adams that Ad Francis's manager was his sister. And brother and sister, they used to go from city to city fighting and earning a living. And then the brother and sister married. They weren't brother and sister at all, of course. They were just living with each other. And when people learned that the odd relationship had turned into a marriage, then they freaked out. By that time, Bugs and uh, Ad Francis himself had lost his sanity. And this is the world that Nick Adams discovers on the road in The Battler. The black man, Bugs, tells him, you better move on before Francis wakes up. And Nick Adams, again, has been through this experience where life becomes inexplicable. How do you explain it? Where is the morality? Where is the governance? Where is the hope? Where is the judgment? Where is the justice? We don't find justice in the killers. We don't find justice when the six men are shot. We don't find justice when the woman in the Indian cap finds her husband dead. We don't find justice when the German climbing over the wall is shot and when Nick Adams is wounded. We just see events moving about inexorably. Kenneth Hoffman says, Nada, N-A-D-A, connotes a series of significant absences, the lack of a viable, transcendent source of power and authority. Where is God? in the stories of Hemingway. There is a correlative lack of external, physical, or spiritual sustenance. The total lack of moral justification for action. And finally, the impossibility of deliverance from this situation. Where is, Bug Ad where is Bugs going to get his deliverance? Where is Ad Francis going to get his deliverance. And where is Nick Adams ultimately going to get his deliverance? For Hemingway, he tells us, Nick Adams is a writer. He'll get his deliverance by writing it out of his system, by putting it on paper, by letting these experiences he ingests come out in some way that becomes therapeutic. Until, of course, with Hemingway, he, know, he loses, he feels, the capability to write, and then there is no therapy. And there is no moral way out, according to religious laws. Here we have the death, attempted suicide as being the way out. Blackness, says Hoffman in describing one of the stories, a clean, well-lighted place. Blackness is what pervades, not light in a clean, well-lighted place. There is so much more one can study with 
Hemingway. One can study profitably a farewell to arms, brilliantly written, though considered by modern critic to be perhaps too romantic. The sun also rises. One of our faculty, Professor Rudat, has discussed all the classical imagery in Hemingway's works in The Sun Also Rises. There's a lot we've done tonight. There's a lot yet to be read.